Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this very exciting webinar. My name is Hishama Hameen. I am the campaign coordinator for Musawa's Campaign for Justice in Muslim Family Laws. I will be moderating today's event. Um, we have people registered from all over the world and multiple time zones. We're really honored that you could uh, join us for this webinar today. And I hope that wherever you're joining from, that you and your families are safe and healthy um, and will remain so. Um, the event is live streamed on our Facebook page and will also be available on our YouTube channel as well. Um, so in case any of your friends and colleagues want to view it later, we can make the link available to them. So I'd like to very quickly run through the agenda of this webinar. We will have a brief introduction about Musawa and our work on Muslim family laws, including the recent campaign that we launched in May 2020, the Campaign for Justice in Muslim Family Laws. Um, we will then have each of our speakers share with us regional perspectives on Muslim family laws for 15, roughly 15 minutes each. Um, we have with us today Marwa Sharif al from Egypt, sharing about the Middle East and Northern African um, region or the MENA region. We have uh, Hala al Karib from Sudan, who will be sharing about the Sub-Saharan African perspective with a focus on the Horn of Africa. And Zaina Anwar from Malaysia, uh, who will be sharing about the South and Southeast Asian region. I will introduce each speaker in more detail just before their presentations. We will then have a question and answer session following the presentations. Please do use the chat box in this webinar for any questions that you may have, and my team will be collecting the questions for the Q&A round. Um, we will also be sharing resor resources and any reference material that the speakers may refer to in the chat box. So please do watch out for those as well. We'll also follow up with an email with all the resources that we've mentioned here. Um, if you're tweeting or posting about the webinar, please don't hesitate to tag us. We are at Musawa on Twitter and at Musawa Movement on Facebook and Instagram. Please do use the hashtag free our family laws so that we can track the conversation happening on multiple platforms. Um, so, so to set the stage for the, for the regional discussion, I would like to very quickly give an overview of Musawa's work. Um, Sorry, just a second. Um, a very quick overview of Musawa's work on Muslim family laws and the context for this webinar. Um, so my, my colleagues will be handling the slides. So many of you are familiar with Musawa, but for those of you who are not, Musawa was formed 10 years ago um, out of a long-standing journey by Muslim women activists and academics who were publicly seeking to reclaim Islam's spirit of justice for all. Um, at Musawa, we firmly believe that equality in the family, and here we define family in all its multiple forms, um, is a foundation for equality in society. And for us, it is impossible for women to achieve equality in society if that equality is not guaranteed in their home and family, and in law and in practice. We call ourselves a knowledge building movement because the basis of our advocacy and activism is a very strong foundation of knowledge and a journey we, to understand and search for equality within the Muslim legal tradition and jurisprudence. We have a lot of books and resources up on our website and social media, um, and we urge you to have a venture through them. Um, through this knowledge seeking, one of the key efforts uh, we undertook was to clarify the distinction between commonly used concepts and terminologies, uh, which are the source, many of these are the source of a lot of myths and misconceptions. And this included concepts like Sharia, Fiqh, and Islamic law. Oftentimes, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, but Muslim women have been accused of trying to change God's divine law when we advocate for reform. Um, however, Sharia, were, as we see on this slide, literally means the path or the way, and it's the totality of the moral values and rules revealed to us. So it's a much bigger concept than what is usually described. While fiqh is a human interpretation of this sharia and Islamic law are the laws that are codified and enacted by governments based on these uh, human interpretations. So when we clarify these terms, we actually understand that our family laws are neither divine nor set in stone, rather they're based on fiqh, which is a human understanding of the sharia. Um, this human fiqh was created many centuries ago for a different time in a different place, and it was shaped by its own worldly context. We were also able to understand and recognize the historical root of the inequalities that affect us today, that plague our family laws, 
because scholars interpreted marriage previously as a concept of domination of the husband and submission by the wife. Men are thought to be protectors of women and the sole providers for the household. Women in turn were required to be obedient to where they, towards their husbands. And our family laws in turn have codified such patriarchal understanding, but this is not the lived realities that we see today. But most importantly, this knowledge building journey, we understood that FIC and family laws um, that it's based upon are not divine, um, like the Sharia. And these mean that they're indeed changeable and can be reformed based on more egalitarian and just understanding of the divine messages and values of justice, dignity, and compassion, which we seek through our work. Um, Musawa has also tried to understand how Muslim family, Muslim women's lives and rights have been affected by discriminatory laws and what lived realities are for women living in Muslim contexts. Hence, one of our key initiatives in the past six years was an effort to understand and map Muslim family laws in over 33 countries, where we documented legal provisions, procedures, and practices on marriage and family-related matters. Um, we discovered 12 key issues that cut across most of these family laws, regardless of which countries or regions they came from. And these included issues that came up before marriage, such as women's ability to consent, child and forced marriage, um, issues that came up during marriage, such as polygamy, but also um, issues that came up at the dissolution of marriage, um, such as unequal divorce, lack of financial rights after marriage, distribution of matrimonial assets, inheritance, and so on. And our speakers today will be speaking to quite a, uh, a few of those issues. Um, so what is the Campaign for Justice and why are we here? Um, the Campaign for Justice was essentially born out of a recognition that these forms of inequalities existed in our family laws. And it also grew out of a historic, hist historic sisterhood of Muslim women from around the world fighting for and advocating for justice and equality within our own families and, and communities and countries. And this led us, uh, led us to the need to identify, um, you know, the need for a global campaign for justice in Muslim family laws. And what we're trying to do is really build a global momentum to put family laws and family law reform on the agenda of governments, um, as well as the international community and treaty bodies, but also on the agenda of women's rights movements, many of whom are hesitant to take up uh, family laws that, uh, that are based on religion. So this webinar is one in a series of public webinars that we will organize throughout this next year or two. Um, depending on the pandemic situation. Um, and they are a part of the Campaign for Justice in Muslim Family Laws. So that's the context laid out for you. And thank you so much for joining us once again. Um, I've taken time to lay the background. So without further ado, I'd like to invite um, Marwa Sharif Eldin to speak on the MENA region. Marwa is a women's rights activist based in Cairo, Egypt. She's the MENA region senior expert at Musawa and a co-founder of the Network for Muslim Rights Organizations in Egypt, as well as several other women's rights organizations in the country. She's, she has been an activist involved on women's rights with numerous NGOs in Egypt. Um, she has also served in the board mem uh, as a board member of Musawa and as a advisor for the Global Fund for Women, as well as the Asian Pacific Re uh, Resource and, Region and Research Center for Women, Arrow. She completed a PhD at the law faculty at Oxford University in UK um, on NGO reform efforts in Muslim family laws using both Islamic law and international human rights and has been a public has published in a number of uh, academic books and media platforms. So Marwa over to you. Thank you very much. Um, welcome everyone. Usually when I talk about Muslim family law reform, I like to start with two points. Um, first, I think it's important to say that the, in all societies around the world, we are all suffering from patriarchy, yeah? In one way or another. And that includes supposedly developed countries where patriarchy is still alive and kicking, by the way, as COVID has shown us very clearly. Um, so we are all in this together and no one is really better than the other. Uh, and we need to develop a sort of equal solidarity between us. That said, the second point is that even though global powers have used the women's question in Islam before as a justification to commit atrocities and launch illegal wars in countries such as Afghanistan and Iraq and so on, yet 
we should not be silenced from engaging critically with our own society's issues, yeah? Finding solutions in our own local resources while interacting with global ones. To advocate silence is to complicitly leave things to fester and deteriorate, and I, I don't see how that can be good for our societies. So having said that, why is Muslim family law reform a priority issue now? And I'm gonna say MFL reform instead of Muslim family law reform, yeah? It has always been a priority in the long history of women's struggles in the Arab region and the Muslim world. But because of time, I will only focus on two family-related issues that COVID-19 has really glaringly brought to the fore. The first one is domestic violence, and the second is women's unpaid domestic and care work, especially in their relationship with the MFL. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna focus on. So we have seen the alarming spike in domestic violence all over the world, really, and also the Arab region as well, where in some countries here, the calls to helplines increased by 100% yeah, during the pandemic. We are seeing the increase in beatings, killings, sexual violence, suicide, child marriage, and all the rest of that ugly image. But to give a bit of context, the Arab region has one of the highest rates of violence against women worldwide at 37% prevalence. The cost of domestic violence in social, psychological, and economic terms in some countries reach more than double what the government spend on education, yeah? And in Egypt, Egypt is the only country in the Arab world who has actually had you know, the, the, the forward-looking stance to try and measure how much it's costing us domestic violence. And here it's estimated at 2% of GDP. These, these are pretty serious numbers affecting not just women like that, but really the entire society. So what has that got to do with Muslim family law then? Well, research shows us that there is a clear link between gender inequality and domestic violence. Many Arab and Muslim family laws not only contain provisions that promote an unequal relationship between the genders, but they also condone varying levels of violence. For example, let me give you some examples. Some of these laws still allow differing degrees of wife discipline, disciplining or beating by the husband. They allow child marriage, mitigation of penalties on so-called honor killings, None of these laws criminalize marital rape, and some still exonerate the rapist upon his marriage to the victim. These laws make it much easier for men to divorce than women and require wives' obedience to their, to their husbands, giving male guardians the right to restrict the movement of women and girls, and of course, the, their access to education, work, legal services, signing contracts, and so on. If we take a look at the definition of violence against women in the UN's 1993 Declaration on the Elimination of Violence Against Women, we find that it exactly applies to these kinds of provisions found in our Arab family laws. And so there is a relationship between our current family laws and normalizing of violence against women in our societies. When the law actually permits it in that way, it, it's like we're saying it's okay, yeah? But the cost of these laws, therefore, become really quite high, not just for women and their families, but even to our economies. So what are we waiting for to reform them? Now, the other issue that we need to talk about, which COVID-19 has shown us the urgency of, is women's domestic and care labor at home. Many of the Arab region's family laws and practices assume that it is the role of women to do this kind of unpaid domestic and care work. Interestingly though, this contradicts um, settled classical Islamic jurisprudence, which does not obligate the wife to do this kind of work, but actually requires her compensation if she chooses to do so. Now is not the time to go into the nuances of this position in classical fiqh, but in classical jurisprudence, but what is interesting here is to see what is it that we choose to take from Islamic jurisprudence and what is it that we leave when we uh, draft our family laws. So now listen with me to these numbers. The Arab region has the highest rate of domestic work for women compared to men in the whole world, where they spend five times more time on unpaid domestic and care work than men. And in many Arab countries, women work more hours than men in the 24 hours per day. Now this is in terms of time spent during the day or time spent doing this kind of domestic work. 
Now, what about the actual economic value of this time? No accurate figures for the Arab region as a whole yet exist, but the latest figures from Egypt indicate that unpaid domestic work for women has an economic value, and listen to this, of up to 30% of GDP. The enormity of this number is actually consistent with global figures because we know that globally, the number uh, comes to 9% or actually $11 trillion of global GDP. These are <laughs> big numbers. So it's really mind boggling how our family laws conveniently ignore the economic value of this domestic and care labor that women are doing. It is this economic worth of a woman's domestic work that is her way of spending on her family even if it's not in direct monetary terms. So it's not like she's reaching into her wallet and bringing out the money to pay the guy or the woman to do the laundry. She's actually doing the laundry herself for free. So in that way, she is spending on her family. This puts her at least on an equal footing with the man in terms of financially maintaining the family. Now this has very important implications because in Muslim family laws, it is the role, this role of spending on the family that supposedly gives men superior rights and privileges due to the way Qawama was constructed by classical jurists. Now, by this logic, if women choose to do domestic and care labor at home, then that should give them equal rights in the law as men, since they also spend on the family through their domestic and care work. Not to mention, of course, that just by virtue of women being citizens, yeah, equal citizens, they should be enjoying equal rights anyway. Another related point to this is that there is a close association between a woman's ability to work for pay outside the home and the unpaid domestic and care work she has to do inside. The more she has to do at home for free, the less she is able to do outside the home for pay. And so what does this result in? It results in an abysmally low employment rate of women in the Arab world. Studies show that if women's participation rates come up to reach those of men in the Arab world, the increase in GDP for the whole Arab region would be a whopping 85%. Yeah, 85% of GDP. Talk about the poverty we are suffering of here. So this is the financial cost of these laws, millions and trillions we're talking about. And I'm sorry I'm talking about money, but sometimes this is what we have to bring to the fore when we're discussing these issues with states and parliaments and so on. Interestingly enough, men are also affected by all this despite the privileges that Muslim family laws give to them. We know from recent surveys that many Arab men feel pressure and stress about being the main breadwinner of the family. And what does this lead to? It often leads to ill health, rising cases of depression, little time spent with the children affecting the quality of their relationship. Now, all this is not to say that women should be forced to work to serve a neoliberal agenda rather than choose to take on domestic responsibilities, which in unpaid form would still be subsidizing economies at the expense of women. Instead, it indicates the family laws and practices in the region must change to provide women with a truly free choice and adequate compensation regarding their labor. Now, the so the three main issues I want to raise on domestic care, uh, domestic and care labor is that number one, this labor really should not be assumed uh, to be an obligation on women, in neither the laws nor in the practices. Rather, it's a choice. And we have Islamic jurisprudence also to support us with that. Number two is that it should be seen as having economic value that translates into benefits such as healthcare, social security, pensions, so on. But it should also be translated into equal family legal rights, such as the cancellation of wifely obedience, a woman's full guardianship over children, her freedom to move, work, travel without the husband's permission, and so on. And as I said, beside a woman being an equal citizen who has the right to all this anyway, a woman's economic contribution to her household through her domestic labor is an added reason about that. Number three, and more importantly, really, is that it should be seen for the truly important and life-giving labor that it is. It should not be seen only as drudgery to be borne by women, but as a labor of care to be shared by all family members, including men, which Prophet Muhammad himself has given us the example of. I have tried in this first part to show the costs and losses of not reforming these MFLs in the Arab region, not just for women, but for the society as a whole. 
the extent of these numbers and the suffering they reflect demonstrate that reform of these laws should really be a collective and urgent priority for all, not just for feminist activists. Now for the second question, which I'm supposed to answer, which is what are the challenges faced in advocacy and activism efforts to reform MFL in the region and how are we moving forward here? So as you all well know, the Arab region is quite a volatile area politically where proxy wars are being fought by different world powers on the ground. This of course has its serious challenges and implications for women and families. It's also a region that is not exactly known for its unwavering commitment to democracy. Worldwide, we are witnessing a shrinking of civil society spaces and we can see it clearly in the Arab region where we find serious threats to women's human rights defenders, for example, and these include assassinations, harassment, imprisonment, freezing of assets, travel bans, and all the rest of it. To top it all off, work on Muslim family ref law reform here can be really quite sensitive and sometimes dangerous. That's not only because it touches upon issues related to faith and religion, no. More importantly, because it interferes with a convenient alliance of sorts which we often find between religious authorities, states, and economic elites, both locally and globally, to preserve a particular balance of power in their favor. This makes the reforms of these laws particularly difficult. Do check the great work of Mala Hatun and her colleagues on this. Um, and there's a slide here, yeah, for all the references I'm gonna be referring to. However, uh, despite all this, uh, I'd like to think that nothing is impossible in front of women. Uh, we still find positive reforms taking place in the different MFLs of the Arab region. And do please uh, look at the work of Lynn Welshman, whom we are happy to have with us today in the audience, and Musawa's Positive Developments Law Table for this. So how is MFL reform even possible in such a difficult context? I use Warner Mensky's kind and concept of living law to show how. For Mensky, law is a hybrid combination of four different types of law that come together in the shape of a kind. State law, natural or religious law, international law, and social norms. Now I put the women's movement at the steering base. This is not Mensky, this is Marwa. Yeah, I, I put them at the steering base of this kite because oftentimes they hold the string connecting all corners, trying to delicately balance between state, religion, society, and international affairs to fly this kite, seeking an opening to push through MFL reforms, depending, of course, on the opportunities that the socio-political moment allows. Now I'm gonna give you some examples. For example, in Egypt, after years of civil society activism that included working with state representatives, in 2001, the Islamic practice of khula was adopted in the procedural, not the substantive, yeah? It's the procedural law, where a woman now has the right to divorce the husband without his consent and without having to prove and present any reasons after, of course, foregoing her financial rights. Activists recount how this was nudged by the fact that Egypt was going to Geneva that year for its first CEDAW state report. And the regime at the time was really quite keen on showing a progressive achievement there, a progressive face to the international and the aid community. So that is part of the political context of the coming of this law. Moving to Morocco, the women's movement kept working for really more than 20 years of patient, relentless activism, using both Islamic and international human rights discourses to reform the MFL. Again, the political context in 2004 finally enabled the passage of this law when a new young king had just come to power and the terrorist bombings in Casablanca the year before spurred the desire to show that Islam has this other modern face. Yeah? In that law, wifely obedience was canceled, polygamy restricted, husband and wife were considered equal partners and with a shared responsibility towards the family. All of this done using religious arguments and justification. In post-colonial Tunisia of 1956, it was at the time important to show the world and former colonial powers that Tunisia was indeed capable of progress without interference. For example, polygamy was banned based on Quranic interpretations, not secular reasoning, no, on Quranic interpretations and the work of the Tunisian Islamic scholar, Tahir Haddad. Today, 
In post-revolutionary Tunisia, with the incessant scuffles between the political Islamists and secularists using the constitution as a site of contestation, a law was proposed to divide inheritance equally between men and women based on the inconsistency of the current laws with the Tunisian constitution. So you see, in Egypt, it was the procedural law. In Morocco, it was Islamic law in combination with human rights. Here in Tunisia, it was, again, Quranic interpretations, Islamic jurisprudence, but also the constitution. Now, we find that reforms also happen through other laws and decrees, not in the MFL itself. For example, in Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Jordan, a domestic violence law was passed combating vow to various degrees. In Egypt, we find that the child law gave mothers guardianship, educational guardianship over their children and provided guidance on the minimum age of marriage. In Palestine, banks no longer require a male guardian's consent for women to open a bank account for their children. Now, the examples are really numerous, but what I'm trying to show you is that reforms are possible using different approaches, despite the challenging context we have here. In all the above, we find a combination of factors coming together to make the reform happen, such as a persistent women's movement pushing the issues, a high profile case or incident, a political moment, sympathetic allies, whether they're inside the state or outside the state, a significant event related to international affairs, and importantly, knowledge that has been developing from within the Islamic framework that addresses the needs of lived reality and citizenship. Finally, even though in this region, it is usually the state that seems to be the source of MFL reform, but both research and practice is showing us that more than anything else, it is really the women's groups organizing that has led to most of these reforms. They raise the issues, they build the knowledge, they mobilize alliances, they pressure lawmakers, they bravely face the demonization and death threats, appeal to humanity and divinity, and they lead the way to change. Kudos to them and to all of you with us here today. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Marwa, for that very insightful overview of the situation in the Nina region. We could spend quite a few webinars just on the region alone uh, to dive into the, both the discrimination aspect, but also the reforms that have taken place in the region. Um, thank you, especially for showing us the link um, you know, in this very timely period um, between discriminatory family laws and the issues of inequality that the COVID-19 crisis um, pandemic has exacerbated as well as the snowball effects that this then has on women's economic rights, but also on the impact of economy and uh, you know, for the countries um, as a whole. Um, the, one of the studies that I'd uh, love for our participants to refer to is the study by Dr. Mala Hatun et al, in fact, uh, and others. Um, and it's titled Gender, Discriminatory Laws and Women's Economic Agency. Um, and basically she draws the conclusion that egalitarian family laws are the most crucial precondition for empowering women economically. So thank you, Marwa, for bringing this up again. Uh, Marwa has written some excellent and timely articles on the impacts of COVID-19 on women um, living under discriminatory laws in the Arab region. My colleagues have already added it to the chat box, so please do um, look at those links as well. Uh, moving on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Hala al Karib. Uh, Hala is an activist and a social and gender research practitioner from Sudan. She is the regional director of the Strategic Initiative for Women in the Horn of Africa, or SIHA, um, and is the editorial head of the annual journal, Women, Islam, Women in Islam, which is uh, exceptional. Um, and my colleagues will also be sharing the link to this journal in the chat box. Hala's activism specifically focuses on women and girls' rights, refugees, displaced persons, and challenges faced by minority communities. She has wide and comprehensive expertise on, Horn, on the Horn of Africa and Eastern African regions. Um, she's also reg a regular contributor to many online and print media and has recently published for Al Jazeera, Open Democracy, Sudan Tribune, the New Hum Humanitarian and the East African news, uh, newspaper. So over to you, Hala, to speak about the, the Sub-Saharan African region. Thank you very much, Shashama. Um, and uh, um, I'm, I'm going to speak uh, primarily about, you know, um, the challenges of having um, um, uh, um, an effective and working family law in 
um, in the sub-Saharan Africa, but particularly focusing on the Greater Horn of Africa country. Um, and um, um, family law has been largely used in this part of the world, you know, uh, by, by governments as, as a tool to fight their own identity uh, politics and, and, and to acquire power. So family law in, um, in the Greater Horn of Africa and broadly in Sub-Saharan Africa is being highly politicized. And, and it's uh, it used to justify um, uh, sovereignty. It used to as an argument when we speak about cultural relativism and and and, and so on. So uh, um, and and so it's uh, it's it's interesting that despite how critical and important family law um, in the transformations of of gender relations on and on issues of gender equality, we find that other issues um, that was widely emphasized by activists in sub-Saharan Africa that does not include families. So most of the efforts um, in this part of the world, people are focusing on uh, women political participation, they are focusing on women access to decision making, FGM, you know, as a form of a struggle that defines the women movement, while family law is all the time pushed into the into the back seat because I think it was masked, you know, by all these political layers of sovereignty, of identity politics, of you know, uh, uh, cultural relativism, and so on. So um, I'm going to specifically speak about um, uh, countries with um, so I speak about countries with minority Muslim populations and countries with uh, majority. Muslim populations in Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly in the Greater Horn of Africa. So, uh, if we talk, to, if we start talking about Ethiopia, for example, which is a country with about, uh, um, uh, I'd say, you know, 35 um, between 31 and 35 percent Muslim communities, uh, uh, Muslim population. Sorry, um, and 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 so it's uh, if we look at um, um, the practices and the legal framework when it comes to family law, we realize that Ethiopia is known to be a, a champion in family law across um, um, the Greater Horn of Africa and across uh, Africa. Um, and however, while that it's uh, it's 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 known about Ethiopia, you know, uh, millions and millions of Ethiopian women are falling um, um, through the cracks when it comes to issues of, of equality. Ethiopia has signed a ratified CEDU and invested um, significant efforts um, to domesticate um, uh, CEDU um, in 2000, in the year 2000 and 2004, Ethiopia has carried a very serious um, legal reform to its family uh, family and criminal law. But at the same time, Ethiopia is adopting a, a parallel um, legal system, which is um, um, enable um, a Sharia court from the state level all the way to the, to the federal level. So, um, so this is largely put women from Muslim communities and, and uh, in, in, in a situation where they, when they have to choose uh, between their own faith and their own communities and connections, you know, uh, uh, if, if they want to access a Sharia court or they want to access a statutory court. So, so, so already you, uh, women are positioned in, in these critical situations. And, 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 and the other issue is the efforts of, of reform you know, and, and, and that's something really important, the, the efforts of reform that's widely, and the heritage of enlightenment, you know, um, uh, within Islam, that's widely known, you know, and discussed and debated in, 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 in the Arab region and in, 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 in the Middle East, um, it's not actually yet uh, there in Sub-Saharan Africa. So the version of family law and, and uh, um, um, that's based on Islamic law in this part of the world is mostly, you know, a, a very militant and very traditional uh, um, sort of family law. So, 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 so basically, um, um, Sharia courts in um, um, a country like Ethiopia, looking at the influence of, of militancy and, and, and fundamentalism, 
on Muslims in this country and the complexity and the willingness of these communities to assert their identity, you know, it represents an extremely patriarchal, patriarchal notions. And, 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 and the other problem that, you know, um, if uh, women started cases within Sharia laws, for example, they cannot actually shift into the statutory court, which provide uh, uh, them with rights and, 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 and everything. So, so in, in one hand, you know, you would see a country that champion um, um, the issue of women's rights, but on the other hand, you know, to reconcile uh, between the different factions of the communities, uh, um, um, uh, many countries in sub-Saharan Africa are settling to the, um, um, you know, that Muslim communities, they should submit, you know, to, uh, to patriarchy and they should accept the injustice um, that's projected through Sharia court, who is not as well exposed to reform, uh, but on the contrary, exposed to a very classical uh, version of, uh, of, of, of Islamic uh, um, jurisprudences. Um, uh, so, um, I mean, um, there is uh, um, the other example also is, uh, is the example of, uh, of Uganda. And, and Uganda is um, um, a country with a minority uh, Muslim population. I would say between, um, the numbers are not uh, uh, very clear, but it's between, um, say, um, uh, 17 to 20 percent of, of, of the population. So Uganda does not have um, a, a family law in place. And they, um, um, the activists um, uh, in Uganda, they say that, you know, Uganda personal status law or what's called the marriage and divorce law, it's considered to be one of the most debated bills in the Ugandan parliament. So it has been going through debate for the past, I would say 15 years. Uh, without moving a single inch. Right now, you know, what the courts had in Uganda, they have um, um, a, 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 a version of a family law that was imposed by the colonial power, I would say uh, by, uh, 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 by the British, I think in the early 20th century. And very typical, uh, it's, it's up to the, you know, um, to the judge, to decide, you know, on the legitimacy of the grievances uh, um, that was presented in front of them. So uh, while there is uh, um, um, minimum standards when it comes to registration of marriage, you know, access to divorce, consents of both partners, when it comes to issues of the matrimonial property, successions, inheritance, it's highly problematic. You know, for women who are living within Muslim communities in Uganda because they had to, they are always pushed to the Qati court or to the Sharia court, which is, as I said, similar to Asubia, largely influenced, you know, by um, um, uh, classical jurisprudence and, and, and actually recently quite exposed to, you know, uh, to religious militancy and to the forces of political Islam who capitalize on persecution of women, you know, to have some sort of political identity. Um, um, this is happening across sub-Saharan Africa. And of course, we all know you know, all the, um, um, the militants movement that's roaming the region and causing a lot of, a lot of insecurity. So, so the choice between that, or you abandon your own identity and go to the statutory court, but it's still in Uganda, there is no guarantee that women can access justice in the statutory court because the statutory court is not only influenced, uh, as I said, by, um, uh, by the lack of, uh, uh, you know, uh, guidance, it's, it's mostly the, the judge decisions. Um, and, and, and so it, it's also influenced by customary, customary courts and by traditions. So polygamy is enabled in Uganda in a way. I mean, um, 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 there is a, a customary court could provide uh, um, a second and a third wife marriage certificates. Yes, you cannot do that in the statutory court, but in the customary court, you can do that. In Sharia court, of course, um, it's, uh, it's enabled and, and, and so on. So this is, uh, 
and and both countries like um, um, for you for Uganda and 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 in Ethiopia um, it's uh, um, it's it's really interesting that these uh, uh, notions of discrimination that are projected you know heavily through the family law are contradicting um, the of course the constitution that speaks specifically into uh, um, equality and and, 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 and and equal rights and so on. But also, um, it's interesting because both countries are known to champion women rights um, um, across, across Africa. So Uganda has a very strong domestic violence um, uh, uh, act. Uh, it has, uh, 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 and, and so is Ethiopia, they have very, uh, a strong mechanism to uh, to address uh, violations against women and girls, but you know, uh, in reality, you know, when we come to the family law that hold all this together, you we find all those loopholes. Now, um, I'm going to speak and highlight um, um, two countries um, that has um, you know, uh, which are considered a, a majority. Uh, Muslim um, countries, um, uh, more or less, which are Djibouti, which is a, a more or less, I'd say, 99% Muslim, uh, um, inhabited by Muslim population, and Sudan, which is majority of the populations are Muslim, with, uh, um, I'd say, 10% after the secession of South Sudan are, are non-Muslim. So, uh, so Sudan um, is known for having, you know, one of the <laughs> I'd say one of the worst family laws in the world. Um, they have uh, the personal status law for Muslims, which was, um, uh, it came up in 1991, and there um, a government that used the notions of political and militant Islam, you know, to gain power and use the identity of, uh, of Islam to uh, um, sort of um, uh, uh, to capitalize on power and to intimidate and interrogate um, um, the Sudanese people. So, uh, so they went, so for them to assert their identity, so they, they identified with the most militant and the most extreme version you know, of, uh, of, of jurisprudence. So it's, it's quite a mix, actually. It's, uh, it's uh, the, the Sudanese family law in terms of, of, of points of reference. So it cannot, it's not following one metab, but within our school of thoughts, within the traditional or the classical Islam school of thoughts, but they intentionally go in and select the most uh, sort of repressive and discriminatory notions, you know, within the uh, uh, different classical uh, juries, and they impose it in family. And I will give you an example for that. You know, um, so so basically, um, uh, Sudanese law is enabling um, uh, child marriage out of the age of ten. So guardianship is quite subtle across uh, uh, the wilaya or the guardianship is subtle across the law. So it's up, it's up to the male guardian of the female child, which when she reach a certain age, and they call it the age of awareness or the age of you know, maturity, and for them, they see the age of maturity as the age of 10. This is according to the family. So as of the age of 10, if the guardian feel that this girl is good for marriage, they can give her away for uh, for marriage, and and they were very specific. So 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 child marriage or sexual violence against children is enabled in the Sudanese um, uh, family law, and and you know this is a family law that is still unfortunately currently working. And you know we have been struggling with the transitional government, but we feel that we are also subjected with Sudan transitional government, despite the huge participations of women in the revolution, you know, and the massive political activism. But again, the agenda is being twisted. So the agenda is being twisted, you know, to the superficial issues that does not address, as Marwa talked, 
that not, does not address, you know, the division of wealth, the division of resources, you know, so like, you know, uh, how many women we are going to have in governments, how many women we are going to have in, in parliament. And I'm not undermining this. I think those are really critical issues. But for us to get to that point meaningfully, we need to start from, from the family. And as you know, um, uh, you have explained, um, Hushama, you know, at the beginning, why Musawa is doing this and why this is very, very important. Sudan also has all, um, um, uh, of course, you know, so the guardianship, it goes uh, into the, you know, uh, women rights to um, even to travel, you know, uh, yes, it is right now, it's not practiced, but it could be actually at any point triggered. Um, um, thousands and thousands of Sudanese women cannot have access to, um, to, their, um, to their children's um, uh, 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 birth certificates and, and so on. So very quickly, how can we shift? Um, I really, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to conclude with the fact that, you know, we really need to shift the agenda within the women movement, which is, I think, that's the most critical um, and, and, important, and important thing. You know, uh, we need, rather than identifying with an important agenda that come to us from somewhere, we really need to start thinking as activists, you know, about what we are going through uh, in our lived realities and, and, and transfer that into a political agenda. You know, because I honestly think that the fight for for a change in family law is a political fight in the first place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hala, for your presentation and the insights into the um, into the region. And you know, the, the African region is indeed a very interesting um, region because it has a combination of countries with Muslim majority populations, but also many contexts where Muslims are a minority. Um, it's also a region that sees codified, uncodified laws, customary laws, religious laws. So there's a multitude of legal factors that are working there. Um, and additionally, there's so many socioeconomic, socioeconomic and socio-political pulls and pushes um, that influence the, the family law system as a whole. Um, in fact, some of the most progressive uh, provisions in Muslim family laws as documented by Musawa um, are from the region. And uh, particularly the example of Algeria, um, please do check out our family law table. Uh, we also have the positive develop, we also track positive developments or positive legal developments in Muslim family laws, um, in the family laws that we're tracking around the world. So um, we'll, link, we'll link you up to, to check that out on our website as well. But, Mar uh, but Hala, thank you so much for reminding us uh, about you know, how the personal is political and the family and family law is indeed a very personal thing that we need to make um, political and bring into our women's rights, but also our political agendas. Um, a, rem a quick reminder to participants, if you have any questions, please do um, ask them in the Q&A box. Our team is collecting them and I will bring them up in the Q&A round to ask uh, the speakers. Um, our next speaker is uh, Zaina Anwar, who co-founded two groundbreaking women's rights groups that engage with Islam from a rights perspective. Um, sorry, just a second. Um, and, uh, and both these groups, in fact, are, are working to promote the rights of women living in Muslim context. She is the founding member and executive director of Musawa, the global movement. Uh, for equality and justice in the Muslim family. She's also the founding member and the founding executive director of Sisters in Islam, a Malaysian NGO working on women's rights within the Islamic framework. Again, she's a prolific writer, speaker, and activist of women's rights. Um, she was awarded the United Nations Malaysia Award in 2019, and she has a monthly column sharing the nation in Malaysia's largest English language daily, The Star. Um, she's going to be speaking about the, South, uh, the Southeast Asian and South Asian region where I'm from, including my own country, Sri Lanka. So Zaina, over to you. Thank you very much, Yish. Um, you know, there's a common uh, misconception, uh, both from within and outside the Muslim world, that the MENA region, so I just want to make this point, you know, has the most number of Muslims. Much of the world seems actually unaware that over 60% of Muslims live in Asia, in Asia, 
while only 20% live in the MENA region. And the country with the biggest Muslim population in the world is, of course, Indonesia, um, Malaysia's neighbor with 225 million Muslims. And this is followed by Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh. So given the diversity um, of religions, ethnic groups, cultures, and traditions in this part of the world, the Islam that developed and grew in this region is necessarily diverse in terms of understandings and practices. This is actually an advantage for us campaigning for reform as we are able to point out that these Muslim laws cannot possibly be divine law when there is such diversity in interpretations and practices. But of course, as we all heard from my colleagues, um, Hala and Marwa, the work on Muslim family law reform remains a huge challenge as we are battling patriarchs in authority, conservative traditional leaders and political Islamists who denounce any call for reform towards equality and justice for women as against the teachings of Islam. The areas of discrimination we heard are similar to the challenges faced in South and Southeast Asia. The fact is Muslim women in much of the Muslim world and communities remain governed by a legal framework that regards men as the provider and protector and the woman as the obedient subservient wife. And this privilege and authority given to men is then reflected in discriminatory provisions in family law on issues such as age of marriage, polygamy, right to divorce, custody and guardianship of children, inheritance, the list goes on. And like Africa also, we see in this part of the world, plural legal systems with Muslim laws governing the personal status of Muslims and parallel, the, and parallel civil laws applying to non-Muslims yeah, in the area of, of family law. What makes the situation outrageous for women's rights activists in the region is that while civil law governing non-Muslim women have moved forward to recognize equality and non-discrimination, Muslim family laws in the name of Islam remain discriminatory. This is totally unacceptable for us. Thus in countries like Malaysia, Singapore, Sri Lanka, and India, civil laws governing marriage and divorce recognize equality between women and men, but not Muslim family law. In the name of Islam, one segment of the population remains discriminated against. This is clearly so in the example of my country of Malaysia, which is a plural country with a plural legal system, where about 60% of the population is Muslim. The civil family law, which governs some 40% of the non-Muslim population, was reformed in the 1970s, 50 years ago, to recognize equality between women and men. Polygamy was banned. Polygamy is not an invention of Islam. It's practiced in, you know, in many, many communities and cultures. Equal, equal right to divorce was introduced. Further reform in the 1990s gave women equal right to guardianship of their children and also recognized equal right to inheritance, but only for non-Muslims. Trends in, in, in law reform for Muslim women actually, at the same time, led to further discrimination as Malaysia, as you know, um, Hala mentioned, the politics of it all, became engulfed in political Islam. In the 1990s and early 2000s, two rounds of law reform were introduced to make the Muslim um, family law in Malaysia even more discriminatory, basically chiseling away at the rights that women had gained in the 1980s. Divorce and polygamy outside the courts, which were banned in 1984. You want to divorce, you want to take a second wife, you have to get the court's permission and meet conditions. That was amended in 1984 and these divorce such divorces and polygamous marriages could be validated upon registration the insurance act was amended to enable the deceased insurance benefits to be distributed according to faraid the islamic um, rule of inheritance this means sons will get a bigger share than the wife and daughters even though this might go against the wishes of the deceased he wants it all to be he or she wants it all to be divided you know equally a fatwa was issued as well for distribution of savings under the employees provident fund according to 
to Farah Aid, even though the employee has named his or her rightful beneficiaries and listed their shares. So we have a situation in Malaysia where non-Muslim women in the name of progress, justice, and fairness gets to enjoy, get to enjoy equal rights with men, while in the name of Islam, and I guess misogyny, the areas of discrimination against Muslim women were expanded even further. This really should be unconstitutional, right? As, as citizens, we all enjoy the constitutional um, safeguard of equal, equal under the law. But thanks, of course, to British colonial rule, the Equality provision in the constitutions of many countries in the region exempts personal status laws from this fundamental right to equality. So while the British took over the administration of our countries and promulgated various laws to govern the public life of the colonized subjects, they allow, allowed or rather conferred on the traditional rulers control over religion, culture, and tradition. So religion was relegated then, of course, to govern the realm of personal law, secondary law. Subsequent attempts then, of course, to reform these laws are often portrayed as threats to group identity and rights, thus making it particularly difficult to build public support and generate the political will to change. In Sri Lanka, for example, Muslim women have been trying to reform the Discriminatory Muslim Marriage and Divorce Act for decades because of identity politics and a constitutional provision that recognizes all written and unwritten laws that existed prior to the 1978 constitution as valid and operative, a family law that is almost 70 years old remains intact until today. And as we heard from the others, decades of, of, of campaign, of you know, working to reform these, these laws, they remain just being debated, yeah? no decisions. Nobody has the courage to make the decision. The fact that these family laws are largely based, of course, on a patriarchal understanding of Islam that discriminates against women makes it convenient for those opposed to change to attack women's rights groups pushing for reform towards equality and justice as being anti-God, anti-Islam, anti-Sharia. As I'm speaking right now, our advocates in the Maldives and Palestine are facing these very attacks, yeah? And yet, in reality, as everyone has mentioned, we see that differences and diversity in Muslim family laws in the region and globally. If it is one divine law, as they proclaim, based on one divine truth, as they proclaim, why the diversity and differences? Within Muslim communities in India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, which follow the Hanafi school of Islamic law, a woman can marry without a wali, without a male guardian's permission. But not in Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, and Sri Lanka, which follow the Shafi'i tradition. In Indonesia, a man needs the authorization of the court and the agreement of his existing wife to enter a polygamous marriage. But in Malaysia and Brunei, the marriage can be validated even if done outside the court without the knowledge, let alone the, the agreement of his existing wife. And yet in all three countries, all three countries follow the same Shafi'i tradition. A key, well, one key area of Muslim family law in which Southeast Asia region leads by example is on matri matrimonial property regime. In Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei and Singapore, women are entitled to a share of the matrimonial assets upon divorce, even if she has not financially contributed to the acquisition of the assets. Her role as wife and mother is recognized as contribution that enable the husband to acquire those assets that are now in his name. However, in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and in fact, in much of the Muslim world, the concept of shared matrimonial assets simply does not exist. This progressive Islamic family law provision in Southeast Asia is derived from urf, from custom, a valid source of law in Islamic legal theory. So in the Minangkabau matri matrilineal tradition in the region, ancestral land and property can only be passed on by mothers to their daughters and granddaughters. 
However, the men in the tribe still have a right of usage of the property and a share of the harvest of the land. This practice led to the development of the concept of jointly owned marital property, where property acquired or developed through the joint efforts of the married couple can be claimed by either party upon divorce or widowhood. And it's really interesting, I just want to share this little snippet to note that British judges during colonial rule were mightily surprised at this practice in their courts, you know, at a time when British law ruled that a man had total control of his wife's property. So it was only in 1870 when the Married Women's Property Act was introduced that married women in Britain had control over their property. And it was the Qadis, yeah, the Muslim judges who had to go to the courts to tell the British judges that these women have a right to property, you know, in settling property disputes, and they have a right to the marital assets, to a share of the marital assets. So these are incredibly rich, um, you know, culture and tradition that exists within our culture that we should be celebrating and incorporating as part of the family law reform and in our search for justice and equality. And there have been recent wins as well in family law reform coming from the Asian region. More recently, India, 2019, India banned the triple tala form of divorce. And Indonesia raised the minimum age of marriage for girls to 19, the same as boys. And in Malaysia and many other countries, we're still struggling to establish a minimum age of marriage without exceptions. A huge congratulations. Congratulations really to these inspiring women activists in India and Indonesia who are part of course of the Musawa movement. So what I'm trying to point out here is the incredible diversity that exists within Muslim legal tradition that enables change to take place. It has been taking place throughout Muslim history in different contexts and periods. So why then this loud proclamation by conservative groups and governments that Muslim family law is divine law that cannot be changed or even challenged. If justice is the objective of Islamic law, why can there not be justice for Muslim women? Why is there so much support for the intolerant, conservative, misogynistic viewpoint as if that is the one and only true understanding of Islam? The truth is, this attack against women's rights women's right to equality and justice is really, in the end, like Hala said, about politics, about power, privilege, and authority. For us women's rights activists, the battle is about justice, about how the laws that govern us must reflect the changing realities of our lives today to ensure that justice prevails. But those who have held power, privilege, and authority for so long, of course, feel threatened by the realities before their eyes and conveniently abuse religion to silence dissenting voices and demands for change. It is for this reason that in countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, India, groups led by Muslim women are at the forefront of the public space to break this hegemony of those who hold traditional authority on matters of religion. What is unique about this activism is that Muslim women are themselves taking the bull by the horn. They're not tiptoeing anymore. In challenging traditional male authority, building their knowledge, carving their own space, and asserting their authority to speak on religion and rights. We believe that in countries where Islam is used as a source of law, public policy, and daily practice, all of us who are affected by the ways Islam is interpreted, codified into law, and used to govern our lives have the right to engage with the religion and shape its understanding and use as it is our daily lives and our well-being that are affected. Sisters in Islam founded some 30 years ago before Islam became globally fashionable, <laughs> was that pioneering voice speaking out in the public space, demanding equality and justice for women living in Muslim contexts, challenging the dominant misogynistic narrative and offering an alternative understanding of Islam. This is critical. You have to offer something positive. You have to offer hope. Alternative understanding of Islam that argues for the possibility and necessity of reform towards equality and justice. 10 years ago, 
this groundbreaking work of Sisters in Islam led to the birth of Musawa, working at the global level. I believe in this global call for reform of discriminatory Muslim family laws. It is important that women's groups organize, create alliances, build public support for an understanding of Islam that upholds equality and justice challenge the patriarchal voice as delegitimizing our demands for reform as against the teachings of Islam. I think we need to be realistic here with the challenges we face. First of all, the family law that governs us, discriminates us, in, are justified in the name of Islam. And when we demand for reform, those in authority and the political Islamists in our countries committed to an Islamic state and punitive and misogynistic laws, try to silence and demonize, demonize us by alleging our claims are against Islam. And we have no authority and no right to speak on Islam. Third, Islam remains important to the lives of the women we want to help. We say we want to help. I believe it is imperative that we build knowledge, courage, and confidence to speak out against the daily discriminations and injustices women suffer in the name of Islam. We all must speak out. And this right, I mean, what is exciting about this period is that there's burgeoning rights-based scholarship in Islam and activism. It's all growing. Following the tradition set by Sisters in Islam, Musawa is unique in acting at the global level by combining scholarship and activism to advocate for change in the legal framework that governs women's lives today. Be it in Sri Lanka, India, Pakistan, and we hear in other countries in the, in the MENA region and Sub-Saharan Africa region, there is growing awareness in the women's movement that you basically, it is difficult form of discriminatory family laws without dealing with the arguments within Islam to justify the possibility of reform and to build the public support, support for the change you want to see. A few months ago in October 2019, we organized our, Musawa organized our regional workshop to bring together groups from South and Southeast Asia engaged in family law reform to share challenges and develop knowledge and strategies to build a campaign for MFL reform. We're planning to link with similar groups in Africa and the MENA region to form a global network for this campaign for justice in Muslim family laws to build the momentum and global support for this urgency for reform. Musawa is leading this campaign. For the past year, we have prepared tables for 33 countries. Isham has shared some of these resources with you. The positive development table to show that in many countries, family law reform has taken place to recognize equality and non-discrimination. We are developing seven policy briefs to make the case for reform on contentious issues such as minimum age of marriage, polygamy, equal right to divorce, financial rights upon divorce, custody and guardianship, and redefining marriage as a partnership of equals. So we're preparing lots of resources because you can't do this work without knowledge. You need knowledge and you need courage, yeah? So we're really building the movement for reform and we really hope that many of you who are now listening to this webinar, who are interested to come and join us, please to together build this campaign for justice in Muslim family laws. And what is also exciting is the fact that we are in a coalition at the global level with several other international and regional NGOs in a parallel global campaign for equality in family law. This seeks to bring all groups working on family law reform across re regions, religions, so it's not just Islam, you know, it's the Christian faith, it's Hinduism, it's um, customary laws, religions, cultures and traditions together to build this global momentum and urgency to end discrimination against women in the league. As Marwa has so much that has been done to show that without equality in the private sphere of the family, there can be no equality for women in the public sphere. We see our campaign as part of the global movement for social justice to, uh, to end all forms of inequalities. And of course, this is in line with the sustainable development goals. The COVID-19 pandemic has dredged up all the long suppressed, unaddressed, or inadequately addressed global problems of inequalities on the basis of class, race, and gender. 
The killing of George Floyd has ignited a global debate on racism against Blacks, the people, people of color, and discriminations against ethnic minorities. As the world today undergoes major political, economic, and public health upheavals, the profound rethinking that needs to take place to find solutions to the gross inequalities of today must necessarily include the urgency to address the centuries-old discrimination against women. Women will not wait anymore. We are human beings of equal worth and dignity within our family, our society, and in the world. It is as simple as that. We will not accept that religion, culture, and tradition can continue to be abused to justify our discrimination. We're building a global movement, galvanizing stakeholders, staking our right to be heard now to ensure that change happens now. We will wait no more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Saina. Um, it is so inspiring to hear you always. Um, uh, I mean, indeed, it is a prominent myth that both, I mean, the myth is both within the Muslim world, but also in the West about the Muslim population and the distribution of it. Um, and many are actually very surprised that, um, that the South and Southeast Asia has, you know, a, the largest Muslim population in the world. Um, and also, I mean, what the, the diversity of the laws and the legal systems, both culturally, you know, lingu uh, linguistically, legally, um, is really testimony of the diversity that can exist within Islamic legal tradition. However, um, it also is evidence that religion gets co-opted by patriarchy, um, and which is why the work of Sisters in Islam is so inspiring. And speaking as an activist who's working on Muslim family law reforms in my home country, Sri Lanka, We've learned so much from the journey of sisters in, sisters in Islam. We really, you know, we follow in the foot, footsteps of giants, really. So thank you for that work and for bringing out so many important issues and for leaving us on a very inspiring note. Um, there is so much to talk about and many questions that have come from our participants. Um, and my team, whom you can see a few of them on, um, you know, on the, on, the, on the chat, but others who are not visible at this moment. I mean, they've been working so hard in kind of collating all this, uh, all this, all these questions for us to ask the panelists. So I will jump on to the Q and A section. Um, basically, how it will go is that I will ask three questions, and uh, we'll take two to three minute responses, and then we'll move on to another round. We have approximately twenty minutes, so kindly keep your responses short, dear speakers. Um, firstly, more general questions to <laughs> more general questions to the three of you. Um, this question has come up um, and keeps coming up in multiple spaces when we bring up Muslim family law reform. If reform of Muslim family laws is so hard, um, and it is particularly in contexts that ha also have civil family laws, um, and in you know Muslim minority contexts and contexts like Malaysia where there's plural legal systems. Um, the question that's asked is if family law reform is so hard and the challenges are so many and women's groups are really struggling to reform their Muslim family laws, why not have a one law for all? Why not have one civil law that applies to all um, the citizens and all Muslims you know, as well? Um, what would be your responses to that? Um, and similarly, is egalitarian Muslim family law possible? We uh, at Musawa and the activists whom we work with have envisioned, um, and we strongly believe as, you know, as Muslims that an egalitarian family law is possible, but we'd really like to hear from you. Um, is it actually possible in reality or is it uh, a utopia that we have in our minds? Um, and also, yeah, let's just answer those two big questions and I will, I will collate the others while you speak. Zai can, Zaina, can we start with you? Um, yeah, <laughs> reform is damn hard. Um, and of course, if we were to go through the civil law route, as you, as you can see um, in, um, in Malaysia, you know, they got the, for the non-Muslim citizens of the country, they have equal, um, you know, rights in the family law since you know, 1970s, you know, and, the, and, and, and law reform continues um, into the 1990s to basically end laws that discriminate against women, but only for non-Muslim. Unfortunately, I mean, there are many reasons why 
you know, for some of us, it's even a non-starter to push for civil law and to basically eliminate um, Muslim family law totally. Number one, um, you know, constitutionally, of course, uh, you know, it provides for uh, Muslims to be governed by Muslim personal um, status laws. And, and I think even more, what's more difficult is the whole issue of, of identity. Um, and I think it, for, my, for many minority Muslims as well, you know, even though, um, you know, in some countries you have access to the civil law that recognize equality, you can choose to opt out of your Muslim family law and go to civil law to get married, to get divorced. You know, many women within the community don't because of identity politics, because of culture, because of social pressure, community pressure. So it's really a non-starter because, you know, I mean, I, I, mean, I can just imagine in Malaysia, say in Malaysia, to say, forget about, you know, if we were to proclaim, you know, end Muslim family law, ab abrogate it, and let's all be governed by one civil law. The attacks against us, I mean, the attacks already, you know, against the work that Sisters in Islam does is already so huge. What more? You're just going to be silenced. There isn't even going to be a debate, at least now what is happening is a very exciting debate on Islam. What Islam, whose Islam is the right Islam? What is the role of Islam in a democratic nation state? How does Islam, um, you know, the, these, these misogynistic interpretations of Islam, um, you know, and the conflict with the human rights treaties that our governments have signed, you know, all these all this debate on con and contestations are taking place. And for me, this is really important for the Muslim community in this, in this country and other countries, that we really need to bring about change in the way Islam is understood, in the way it is practiced, in the way it is used to be to, to codify into law, yeah, in ways that are often discriminatory. And this debate is so critical to bring our understanding of Islam into the realities of the 21st century. So for me, this is really a critical work for the Muslim community throughout the world, really. Thank you. Marwa, if you'd like to add to that. Yes. So it's, I mean, I'm not going to handle the first question because Zaina has already taken that. And it's, it's very similar in the Arab region. It's very tied to identity politics. Even the people, the people themselves, you would find a majority who would want to have Christian family law, Muslim family law. I mean, it's, this needs a whole webinar for itself. But of course, having one law for all seems like a good uh, idea for some, but we do live in contexts where the identity politics and how religion is being used also politically would not really allow that in the short term. So I'm not going to comment on that. Now, is equality possible under Muslim family law? The short answer is yes, of course, it is possible. And I think it's important to realize several things. Number one, uh, that we do have multiple Islams with an S, yeah? We have the Islam that says a woman has to obey her husband no matter what. And we have the Islam, and we see that reflected in some laws. And we have another Islam that says, no, no obedience but to Allah, yeah? And she is, according to the Tawhidic paradigm of Islam, just as equal as her husband, okay? And we have that also reflected in some uh, Muslim family laws. So it's not, it's not fiction, yeah? We can see it in legal reality. So number one, what kind of Islam are we basing our laws on? Uh, and again, the, what you mentioned, Hishama, in the very beginning, the difference between fiqh and sharia. So sharia is the divine message that yeah, Muslims believe it has come from God. But fiqh is the human understanding. And it's this human understanding of sharia that produces all these different Islams that we see in front of us. So that's number one. Number two, and I'm trying to be very quick, uh, but we can take it up later, equality. We have, we have also, we have to understand what, what is equality. So are we talking about formal equality where a man and a woman have equal rights to become candidates to, for presidency, for example, you know, to run for presidency. Yes, um, but there's also substantive equality. And, and that actually can help us. I mean, in Muslim family law, is, there's a lot of harmony and syncing between substantive equality and what we find in a lot of Muslim families. And substantive equality 
is the kind of equality that takes into consideration the differences, the social differences, the historical differences between men and women, you know, how women were underprivileged, for example, in their access to education. So they have to be treated, given sometimes some uh, advantages to, to, to level the ground, you know, make them start the race just as much as men. So under substantive equality, for example, you can have an egalitarian Muslim family law that says no obedience from the wife to the husband but he still has to pay the nahaka because women have been historically underprivileged in accessing work opportunities. Uh, they haven't uh, been, th there are things, there are laws that stop them, for example, from going outside and working at night. Because of all that, we will, under a substantive equality paradigm, we will say that women no longer have to obey their husbands, even though the husband still has to pay the nahaka. And, and that can come under Muslim family law. Until we are able to lift all these uh, restrictions yeah, yeah. on women's ability to move and to work, and then we can move on to another type of equality, the formal kind of equality. And it's not either or. You can have all of these uh, formal equality, substantive equality, transformative equality, all of them coexisting together under Muslim family law. Thank you. Thanks, Barwa. Uh, Hala, before you add on to that, uh, the first two questions, I also want to bring a very context specific and related one. Um, and that is the question of customary practices. Um, and some, and lo a lot of practices customary in customary law and religious law uh, in the region are not codified, right? So what would, is a civil law that applies to all communities um, on family matters? Is it feasible? Is it possible? Is it the right direction? Or is Muslim family law and an egalitarian Muslim family law possible for the countries that you've described? Well, I, I think, you know, the law comes from somewhere, you know, um, the law comes, it's a construct of who we are, you know, um, and it can, it can be called a Muslim family law or it can be just called a law, you know, like in, um, um, you know, in, in, in many countries, you know, um, so, but it has to be informed or it's usually informed by who we are, you know, and what we aspire to be, you know, and, and right now, you know, um, basically what's happening is you would see that all the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, and in the Greater Horn of Africa, the constitution talks about equality and it talks about, you know, um, 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 preserving the, the rights of women and it talks about substantive equality, even in certain cases, like in the, you know, constitutional documents in Sudan and so on. But uh, when it comes to actual practice, the practice is that, you know, the discrimination against women is legitimate, you know. So, um, uh, because um, the, uh, the the politics that dictates and 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 apply, you know, and interpret these constitutions and these documents, it's it's really um, it's take it it's 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 basically a, a discriminatory politics. It's a politics that's observe and and see clearly that women must be um, um, undermined in terms of their access to resources and, and, and so on. So even customary laws that actually observes um, um, and give women some rights, you know, um, in, in, in certain parts of, uh, of Sub-Saharan Africa, that's been manipulated at the moment, you know, and, and, uh, um, and, and used to uh, and and changed actually, you know, um, 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 to uh, to become extremely um, discriminatory. And and in this, I can give a very quick example, like the access to land, for example, in Uganda, you know, which is a very serious issue here um, in terms of women have completely blocked, according to not directly through customary law, but the practice of customary law from accessing um, um, land for example, even, um, uh, and, and also the uh, Kisser in, in Somalia, which is a customary law in Somalia, where, you know, it has very, um, it has certain parts that's actually enable women to earn what they gain, you know, but then the interventions of the um, uh, Sharia courts, um, it's actually taking that away. And then, the, because customer are not written in stones, 
you know it's really influenced by different cultures and traditions and they keep and they keep changing so basically i will just say what zaina has said earlier you know uh, as um, um, as muslim you know and as as women you know we don't have to you know uh, be uh, uh, we don't have to struggle with discrimination and assume that uh, uh, the law is actually constructed in a way that undermine us and discriminate against us. And this is the situation right now, you know? Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you so much for those responses. I would like to move on to a, um, a question on what is possible and what uh, is not and how, how, how is it possible? So I'm just merging a couple of questions that uh, different people have asked. Um, and again, uh, to all three speakers, um, there was one specifically to Marwa, but I think it would be good to hear from the others as well. Um, what strategies have allowed us to shift past the impasse between traditional Islamists and Muslim reformists? Um, some of this, what, what has worked when it comes to Muslim family law reforms in the context that you um, are speaking to today? Um, how have interpretations of religion evolved with time? And is there room for multiple interpretations to exist you know, in this journey of reform? Um, and relatedly, and this was a question specific, specific to Marwa, um, uh, proposed legislative reform in the MENA region particularly, um, should it be conducted in a gradual approach given that there's so much you know, that needs to be done in terms of just um, you know, working with Islamic legal tradition? Um, and what and what are the, and taking into consideration some of the legal, you know, cultural and socioeconomic factors, is it what's the trajectory looking like in reforms in your in your idea? I mean, in your experience. Shall we start with Marwa on this one? Sure. Yeah. So I think what I tried to to show in my presentation is that every country really has its own sociopolitical context. So in some countries and in some historical moments you could have radical change. For example, Tunisia in 1956, they could change the whole law yeah? uh, and make it you know, definitely much more progressive than it was before. In some other countries, this political moment does not present itself. And that's why you have to work in a more gradual approach using certain topics. So for example, uh, again, in Morocco, uh, you had a very sad story, Amina Al-Fileli, you know, she, she was someone who was raped. The rapist proposed to her in marriage. She had to marry him and she eventually committed suicide. And it was that incident that pushed a whole movement at the time to repeal that part of the law. Um, they, they couldn't ask for other things at that particular moment of time as it was in 2004, for example, where they were able to change the whole law. So it's the same country where in, in an one instance, they could change the whole law in 2004 because certain things came together to enable that. In another moment, it was a certain case or incident that helped them move forward only on that incident. So really, it's politics, yeah? Activists are politicians in a way. They have to, they have to assess, and I was trying to show through the kite, you know, you have to assess these four corners. What is, what is the opening that I can go through here? And, and really to be smart about it. You know, we can't, at certain moments, we can't ask for everything. And in other moments, we can really push, yeah? And it depends on the kind of alliances we have, you know, the grassroots mobilizations we are able to make and, and so on. So whether it's gradual or radical, it's, it's up to the, the, the particular kind of local setup in that moment uh, at the time. Um, yeah, so I, I hope I answered that. Anything else I missed? You're muted, Hish. Thank you. Thanks, Marwa. Uh, Zai, shall we move on? Do you, would you like to respond yeah, to that? Yeah, I, I guess, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, the strategies are multiple, really, and it really depends on, like, the right timing for it. Um, you know, for example, the Indonesia, ra Indonesia raising the age of marriage um, to 19 last year, that came about as a result of a court case, a constitutional court case, where three women who were victims of child marriage took that issue to court. So that's a strategy. And the court actually said, this is unconstitutional. Yeah, this unequal treatment of women is um, unconstitutional. So there was a great court decision. Then the government then has to 
promulgate a new law to respect that court, to uphold that court decision. And what was so important for Indonesia is that the women's movement have already mobilized on the issue of child marriage. And in fact, um, um, KUPI, this um, network of women ulama, this amazing network of women um, ulama in Indonesia, issued a fatwa against child marriage. You know, so, so taking that, you know, I've talked about how you need to carve that public space and you need to assert your own authority and claim your right to speak on these issues. So these women ulama got together in a one big huge convention and issued three fatwas against domestic violence against child marriage and provided all the arguments. So when the government was pressured because of the court decision to amend the law, these, the, gr the group, the women ulama, were called in by the government to provide all the, what are the arguments in Islam to say that this is not against Islam. The constitutional <laughs> court is not an Islamic court, yeah? On the basis of the constitution, it struck down um, the discriminatory age of marriage. But the government, because they're politicians, they need public support, they don't want to be attacked. They need arguments within Islam to say that raising the age of marriage to 19 is not against the teachings of Islam. And the women's groups were ready with those arguments because they had worked on it, they had researched it, they had issued a fatwa. So it's extremely important, timing is extremely important, and building our knowledge and creating this tradition of debate that the voice on Islam, on what Islam is and what it's not, is not the sole monopoly of the yeah. ulama, of the religious scholars, of the male authority. We as women who are affected, we need to assert our right to speak out and offer, like Marwa said, you know, the which Islam? We want a just, compassionate Islam that recognizes our right as a human being of equal worth and dignity. What is rocket science about that? Who doesn't <laughs> want to be recognized as a human being of equal worth and dignity? Um, you know, I tell my men friends, your life will be so much better you know, if you just respect women as human beings of equal worth and dignity. You know? so, so I think, I mean, the point is that you know, there are many, many strategies and we just need to be out there in the public space. The time of trying to bring change behind, you know, closed doors, speak um, within four walls because you shouldn't embarrass your religion. You shouldn't embarrass your community. Why do you want to tell the whole world how terrible Islamic law is because it discriminates against women? Let's talk. Hey, man, we've been talking for decades no change has happened. Enough talking behind four walls. We need to speak out in the public space, build our courage, build our authority, build our knowledge, and build public support to demand this change. Thanks, Ai. Um, Hala, I'd like to add to the question that, was, uh, that, was, that I asked but with another question from our participants, and that's specific to the Sudanese context. Speaking of timing, being critical in the journey for reform. Um, the question is, do you think the Moroccan approach can serve this situation, especially um, you know, with the changes that's happening in Sudan um, and where radical change can be brought about by a revolution um, and this revolution can act as a solid platform for structural reform? What is your take on this? And is family law possible in this context in Sudan? Could you speak a bit more about that? Um, thank you. I think I'm, uh, well, I'm going to quote uh, Marwa. She said something long time ago and it stuck with me um, in uh, one a presentation years back. So she said change, and in a way she said it now, she said change has so many roots and it can happen um, through different windows. So we should not really assume or stuck to certain modality. So uh, just to add to the first questions, you know, uh, basically in, in, in the Horn of Africa, if you look at the Djiboutian experience, we have an, um, you know, an uh, authoritarian government, you know, uh, who uh, actually um, imposed an extremely progressive family law, but, um, um, and it was used against them at the beginning by different faction of the opposition, but right now the women are very clear, there is no turning back you know, regardless of the type of regime that's going to rule Djibouti. 
So here we have a change, you know, that's happening. But then when we talk about, um, about Sudan, you know, um, and we see 60% of women participated in the protest against uh, uh, an authoritarian, you know, militant Islamist terrorist regime, you know, and, and they really did everything they can. Um, uh, however, you know, uh, unfortunately so far, um, um, there is, we, we are in the stage of the, of the setback. So the agenda is being largely manipulated. We are falling into the whole notion of tokenism, you know, about, oh, we respect women's rights. Women's rights are very important, but there is no political decision or courage, you know, or push to, uh, um, towards making fundamental reforms when it comes to, you know, to the family law. And I think it what for me what trigger and what come down to is as activists and and this is really a challenge in this part of the world and and in sudan and in across the the greater horn of africa we need to learn you know what's important you know and you need to be more strategic in our approach um uh, and and to be more tactful you know uh, rather than being um sort of drifted you know, and driven, you know, by the patriarchal agenda, who is um, sometimes they position themselves, you know, as the guardians of, of, of women movement, especially when a country like Sudan is going through a big transitions, you know, you'd see a lot of voices uh, of, of, of patriarchs who are positioning themselves as the guardians of the women movement, start dictating what women should want and what women not want. So I think the homework is, you know, for the women rights activists to do their homework, as, as uh, Zaina has said, and to understand that, you know, uh, the compromise should not be, you know, giving our faith and our religion and our identity again is, you know, accessing and acquiring justice. And that's really very, very important here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there's, there's a couple of questions that have come up in terms of religion and religious discourse and fake um, that I really want to highlight uh, and get into, despite the fact that we are actually running out of time. So maybe one last round of questions. This one's to you, Marwa. Um, in the process of in the process of reforming Muslim family laws, um, hold on, sorry. Yeah, in the process of reform, reforming Muslim family laws, how, what, how do we use Islamic jurisprudence and Islamic jurisprudential tools um, to our advantage in making the case for reform? What are some of the strategies that have, we, that have uh, been used in the MENA region? So that's one question to you. Um, to Zai, a quick question on minority Muslim context. Now, the, the, the issue with regard to triple talaq was that many, um, you know, one of, the, one of the challenges was that it, it came during a time when it was not a progressive government um, and, and uh, almost anti-Muslim government, in fact. So when, when change comes about in a context where um, there is Islamophobia that's rife uh, in the political context and how do we address this? And what have some of the groups who have worked um, on, the, on this in India, you know, uh, mentioned to you about it? Um, and a quick question to Hala in terms of, um, in terms of, um, uh, no, Hala, you've addressed all your questions, so that you're good to go. So I'd just like to very quickly, quickly go to Marwa and, uh, and Zaina to wrap this up. In the meantime, to participants, we're putting up a poll. It's just two questions. Um, it'll appear um, somewhere on your screen, but while, while we're wrapping up this Q&A round, we'd really like you to please fill in the poll um, so that we can improve on our webinars uh, in the future and serve you better um, and bring out the information out there better to you. So thank you for doing that in advance. Yes, Zai, okay. over to you. Oh, sorry, Marwa, go ahead. Sorry, Zai. Um, okay, yeah, on the, on, on, you know, what happens when change um, is handed or, or, or takes place, um, you know, by right-wing governments, um, you know, dicta dictators and all that. You know, I mean, if we want everything to be perfect, you know, that a government that upholds human rights and women's rights to deliver the change, you know, it's, it's, it, you know, 
it is going to take forever. All our countries are governed by, you know, most of our countries are governed by despotic um, governments. Um, and so I think it, then it's really up to the women's rights groups. You know, I understand like the Triple Tala issue, the, the BMMA, who was one of the women's groups that led it um, in India, was criticized by the women's movement. Um, and, um, and, but you know, women have been suffering. I mean, we talked to them about this. They, look, women have been suffering from triple tala for decades or more. And, you know, and they've been fighting for change for a long time. It has not come. So for them, whether it comes from a right wing, left wing um, government, it doesn't matter. The fact is that the change, what the women have been fighting for, they got that, that change that they wanted. But I guess it's also important then for women's groups who have made gains in this way um, to also remain critical. Yeah, when the government does wrong, when the government attacks other human rights activists, women's rights activists, or is opposed to other kinds of law reform, call a spade a spade. Be honest and be, remain critical. That, that is important. And really, like, it's the same in Malaysia when Sisters in Islam was campaigning. Like I mentioned, the Guardianship of Infants Act was amended um, to recognize equal right to guardianship for non-Muslim women, but not for Muslim women. We lobbied the government then to, because we knew we couldn't get reform of the family law, what we did was we pushed for procedural reform. Um, and we got the government to agree, the cabinet to agree to introduce policy reform that says all the forms, the government forms that require the signature of the guardian, and in Muslim family law, the guardian means only the father, change it to guardian, father, or mother then the Muslim women can benefit from that law reform that applied only to non-Muslim women. And there were women's groups who criticized us. For, and of course, when the government announced that change that we lobbied for, we welcomed it. But we were also criticized because the government at that time was a very unpopular government and said, why do you ex accept any, we shouldn't lobby or accept any kind of reform that comes um, from uh, uh, you know, an unpopular government because you're legitimizing the government. Right. But for us, look, we've been fighting for decades for this and we are not going to like reject change just because everything around it is not perfect. Right. We just need to be honest in bring, remaining critical um, and fair um, in welcoming what is good and being critical on what is bad. Thank you. Thank you, Zai. Marwa, over to you. Okay, so I'm going to try to answer the question in relation to other questions on polygamy, FGM, and inheritance as well, to give it as a case study. So how can we engage with Islamic jurisprudence in our advocacy effort to reform the law? We have so much resources within Islamic jurisprudence that actually push us forward and encourage us. And very quickly, I mean, I encourage you to look at, this, at Musawa's um, framework of action because we do provide some of these. For example, what Hish was uh, talking to us about in the very beginning, the difference between sharia and fiqh. So what we are doing here, we are not touching the divine part of Islam, which is Sharia. We are talking about fiqh throughout. Muslim family law is based on human interpretation. So it's fiqh. And this is very important because it really strengthens us. We're not, we're not talking against God. We're engaging and agreeing or disagreeing with other human beings yeah, who have done some effort, some you know, ishtihad, and it's le completely legitimate to go back and forth with them. That's the first thing. The difference between sharia and fiqh is very important. The difference between ibadat and mu'amalat. So these rulings that have to do with the relationship between you and your God, ibadat, we don't touch those. Like, you know, prayer, fasting, we don't, we don't come near those. It's, it's mu'amalat, which are the issues, the rulings related to your relationship with other people on this earth, in this worldly realm that we are talking about. And according to jurisprudence and to Islam, that this is very permissible, actually. And we were given the license to do that by the Prophet himself, to, because we know best our own worldly issues here. We should also know, a lot of people don't know this, that the Islamic legal history is very rich with differing opinions. On the same matter, we have multiple interpretations of the same verse, for example. Jurists disagreed amongst them, and they even had an etiquette in disagreeing. 
whenever a jurist, a classical jurist, would write a treatise or an opinion or a legal uh, ruling about one thing or the other, they would always end it with two words, Wallahu a'lam, and God knows best, because they know that this is just a human effort. Yeah? Yeah. So we have this very rich doctrine of ikhtilaf, of difference. So it's completely okay for us to have these differing opinions and to take this bit from here and this bit from there to suit our current needs today and to create a new jurisprudence. Yeah? We are humans as well. You know, Muhammad Abdu, the Grand Mufti of Egypt at the beginning of the century said, they are men, referring to the classical jurists. I would add to him, they are men and women. And we are men and women as well. So we are empowered to do that. Maqasid, the Sharia, which is the objectives of Sharia. If something or the other is being forced upon us, but it's, it's beyond logic. We can see the harm of it. it if it's against Maqasid, the Sharia, the objectives of Sharia, Sharia did not come here to make our lives miserable. Rather, it came for justice, for peace, mawadda and rahma, mercy, love. If it's against those, we are empowered to question it. I don't know if we have time for me to go through inheritance, FGM, and polygamy. Okay, we don't. I think don't. it's the last thing I will then say is, do we truly believe that religions came for equality and justice? Actually, we ourselves need to believe that before we're able to move forward and convince others with it. And when someone tells me what you're doing is wrong, it's against Islam, I have the obligation and the responsibility to ask them, what Islam are you talking about? Which Islam are you talking about? It is the Islam of justice, peace, equality, mawadda and rahma, or is it another one? And please prove it to me. So I'll end on that. Thank you so much. That's such a strong note to end on and so inspiring, um, you know, for you to, to say this as our closing words. Um, my biggest thanks to Zaina, Hala, and Marwa for joining us today, and to all the participants who've been um, with us. There's 83 of you on the webinar who have remained with us throughout the entire, um, entire time. So thank you so much for that. I'd like to thank my team who's behind all this amazing work, sharing resources, planning and organizing all of this. We have Suri Kemper, Alex McCarthy, Zuleha Hussein Shihab, and Sarah Marceau, who are at the back end handling all of this <laughs> so well. Um, so thank you for coordinating and organizing this webinar. The recording will be available on YouTube in the coming days. Um, all information about the Campaign for Justice and how you can get involved are up on our website. And if there's any questions that you want, you know, you want burning answers to or any resources that we can, uh, we can help with, please don't hesitate to reach out to us on any of our social media platforms, really. Um, and we'll also be able to connect you with speakers um, and, you know, and, uh, and uh, organizations like uh, SIHA, where Hala is, um, is from. So thank you again for joining us. And we will have a many more of these coming up in the next year or two. Please stay safe, everyone, um, and healthy, and we hope you will join the next one. Thank you again for joining today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.